tenakoto, tenakoto nami nui ki a koto, um, ko te tare hoa auta aho, no, uh, ko Janice Lord Taka Lingua. So I'm Janice from the botany department, and uh, as um, as Lynn said, this talk is part of a pair of talks that are um, going to tell you a bit about a project that we started not that long ago uh, as a result of us talking together, meeting each other through Hiko Papa Hongonga, and also receiving some seed funding from um, Hiko Papa. So that was it's uh, evidence of the stimulation and uh, ability to talk to each other that has produced some new research. So the, uh, the, the project's really become focused on freshwater management. We haven't ended up doing a lot about tree planting and that's what was in the program, sorry. But um, most of what we've been looking at for this project is about freshwater management. And the reason why we became interested in this topic is simply because uh, um, not only the importance of freshwater systems, so I mean uh, rivers and streams, lakes, but also bogs, marshland, all those other kinds of wetlands uh, are fairly uh, uncommon in the landscape. They don't occupy large areas of the landscape necessarily, but in terms of cultural significance, food and water, mahingakai, um, sense of place and belonging and also recreational opportunities, tourism opportunities, are actually very important um, to human society. So freshwater uh, management significantly affects a wider community and yet there's this disconnect because at least in New Zealand and I'm sure in, in many more countries around the world the bulk of freshwater systems are often on private land so privately owned in whatever way that means. So in New Zealand an estimate is at least half of all freshwater systems and wetlands are on private land or privately owned land and yet they're part of these catchment systems that have much wider benefits. So this is a, um, a diagram uh, from Dairy and Z, uh, basically illustrating, can I point? Yes, I can, look at that. Ooh. Uh, illustrating um, some of the ecosystem services that freshwater systems provide, uh, filtering overland flow, um, trapping sediments, um, filtering out perhaps uh, agricultural runoff, mitigating um, flow, flood, uh, flood mitigation, so um, ameliorating the peak flow, and also providing the other resources in terms of habitat and water for actual use. So freshwaters might be, freshwater systems might often be privately owned, but their benefit is felt by a much wider community. And then going bigger still, um, freshwater systems and wetlands are significant at a national level and a much larger scale because of their role in carbon sequestration. The reason why, and you might, you know, when you think of um, vegetation systems on land and carbon sequestration, you might think of large forest, uh, but the wetland soils in particular, and I, I was very happy to hear that the, the, was it the freshwater group talking about soils, wetland soils in particular store a lot of carbon simply because uh, when organic matter is incorporated into that profile, often it's anaerobic, the decomposition rate is low, so that organic matter stays buried in the soil profile. When you drain a wetland or a wetland dries out, then decomposition starts again, and that can release methane and carbon into the environment. So wetland soils are actually a really important store of carbon in the overall terrestrial carbon cycle. So again, the idea that these freshwater systems that might be on private land uh, are have wider community benefits, but then also significant larger scale benefits in terms of carbon stores. Right, so just showing you some numbers to emphasize that. Um, as I said, even though wetlands are a fairly small uh, proportion of a land area in terms of vegetation type or the landform type, uh, the carbon stored in the soil, and these are values for New Zealand, uh, that's the reference there. The carbon stored in the soil and wetlands, and this is tons of carbon per hectare, exceeds the carbon estimates for above ground biomass and native forests. So it's quite significant. And obviously what happens to wetlands uh, in New Zealand uh, can have an impact not only on those ecosystem services for the greater community, but also in terms of um, 
we were getting bang for our buck in terms of being able to store or protect carbon rather than releasing it into the environment. Right, so there's been a lot of talk over the last couple of decades about deterioration in water quality. It's been something that's featured uh, greatly in, in, um, in the media and public concern. Uh, there's been newspaper articles about rivers that are no longer swimmable, that people can remember swimming in them as children. And there's, so there's been a, a, a very definite move uh, over the last couple of, well, particularly the current government and the previous term, uh, to look at regulations about water use in the context of climate change, but also pollution and water quality to how, in terms of how to manage freshwater systems better. The idea of ownership, and I will reference this now, the idea of ownership, um, there's a very definite disconnect between um, legislative ownership and property boundaries and the, and the way in Te Ao Māori, uh, ownership in terms of um, looking at catchments as a whole and resources in a whole. And something that our project is not touching on at the moment, but we really want to move towards is whether there's Mataranga Māori that can be brought to bear on understanding how better to manage these sorts of resources. But we got talking, the four of us got talking, um, so myself, Victoria Kahui, Sarah Walton and Alicia Lord, uh, got talking about how the changes in policy and the changes in government regulations in terms of fresh water, uh, whether they were likely to achieve the outcome that was intended and how that was affecting the people whose, whose land contained these wetlands. So these kinds were kinds of the media releases. This was 2019 where the government was announcing it was getting tough on farming um, by regulating for water. So very definite top-down controls targeting um, rural communities. And also from the other side of it, there were great um, positive media releases about conservation gains, Lake Wairarapa becoming a wetland of international significance. Uh, so again, in the way that this has been approached from the policy point of view, there was a disconnect between how um, regulations were being targeted of private landholders and conservation gains were very much at a larger scale, perhaps a regional council scale. What we also, you may also recall, you've seen this in the media yourself, is that there was, there has been quite a considerable pushback from the rural community whose land holds these wetlands of significance. Uh, the, um, the fear that there will be regulatory burden, the affordability of the proposed changes, um, the ability to follow these new regulations has been bubbling up as a concern. And uh, so our project started with um, this situation where you have policy trying to achieve very good, uh, well, perhaps desirable outcomes, um, but pushback from the, the people who felt they were targeted by these policies. Um, oops, I went the wrong direction, didn't I? So just to give you an example of the transformative vision. And, and Victoria is going to explain in more detail the, um, the nature of the policy and the economic, I guess, the, the economic interpretation of that. Uh, you could uh, very easily pick many parts of the country where um, fencing off a wetland would be fairly straightforward, planting it up and very easy to see the kinds of gains in this system. And the kinds of gains that would be achieved by this is obviously, um, you know, intercepting runoff from developed pastoral lands, providing habitat, improving water quality. And in these sorts of environments that could be fairly logistically straightforward. Uh, but one of the issues is that New Zealand doesn't all look like that. If we look like that, we would be the lowlands of England or somewhere. Um, New Zealand, and particularly in the South Island, we have places like this. And you can see now that if you're a farmer, this is the Tyree, upper Tyree scroll plain. So this is where the Tyree River comes down out from behind the back of Lake Onslow and sweeps through the Maniototo Plains, does a big hairpin, and then comes down past Middlemarch. This is dissected by multitudes of farming properties all around the edge of it. It's seasonally dry. It's incredibly important for the economics of these farms because when all of this land goes brown during summer, 
this is the area that's able to be grazed. It's not, it's not wet at that time, but at least it's got grass on it. Um, and there are, there are very real concerns for all of these landholders, and some of them we've talked to, about what would happen if they had to fence all of this off and what would, um, how you would even go about that. So I'll just hand over to Victoria, who's going to talk about the policy. Right. Oh, give me that. <coughs> Kia ora, I'm Victoria from the Economics Department and I studied for a long time um, Kia ora, can you all hear me? Yeah, cool. So I'm from the economics department. I have um, studied for a long time fisheries management. So um, I'm always interested in when we have a natural resource problem, how do we actually uh, incentivize um, resource management um, in a way that we achieve what we're actually trying to achieve? So it's people behavior, not on a small scale behavior like maybe psychology does, but more like in terms of uh, market mechanisms or incentives sent through. So freshwater has been an issue in New Zealand for a long time, or more recently, um, um, the government has introduced this national policy statement for freshwater management, which came into effect on the 3rd of September, 2020. And I'll just give you a quick overview what this policy intends or tries to do. And, what uh, we might see from this. So I often um, in the habit of thinking about uh, things like regulation versus maybe tradable rights or um, taxes or different types of policy instruments. So economists often have a little toolbox that they think about. So this is this regulation and in the regulation, the policy statement is, it gives explicit acknowledgement to te mana o te wai. So really thinking about the freshwater system. And when we talk freshwater system, we talk about um, rivers, we talk about a wetland flowing into um, an ocean and thinking about maintaining or enhancing um, the system as it is. So the key is on not uh, accepting any further degradation of the freshwater systems as they are. That's really the key focus, right? So maintain or even enhance if possible. And it's not just the focus on water quality, but I think the legislation very nicely acknowledges, you know, well, we have since the millennium assessment, we have so many different aspects that the system gives us. We, we call it natural capital, right? We've got all these ecosystem services. One of it is drinking water, but the other one is habitat for biodiversity. Um, well-being, this is a big concept now um, that we see coming through the government. Well-being in the sense that I can swim in this river and my children can, and that gives me satisfaction or um, some sort of utility or benefit. So it's focusing really on all these aspects that regulation. And of course, it's, it's envisaging, at least in the statement, um, that there is a strong community involvement and tangata whenua. This is the sort of uh, vision this, this, policy, this regulation has. Yeah, go. Yep, no, one for back here. The way they do this, um, when we looked at the regulation is now, so basically the whole of New Zealand is um, dissected into fresh water management units. Now, New Zealand has a lot of experience with that because that's of course how we manage our coastal fisheries, right? So we have these quota management areas. So they're trying to do the same thing on land. So we've got these fresh ma um, water management units and councils have to identify particular fresh water systems. So for example, all wetlands um, equal or greater to 0.05 hectares have to be mapped and even smaller wetlands if they're particularly important for biodiversity. Once they're identified, so once they're on the map, then immediately what kicks in are certain regulations. And these are quite stringent. So I know this because I actually live overlooking a wetland. And I've actually talked to staff, council staff and we had some particular issues out in Brighton uh, with a proposed landfill and we've had so I've had a lot of interaction with this and we've actually started replanting. And once something is wetlands, you can't, even if it's for the better, like you want to think about putting a pond somewhere to say, well, you can't actually change that land. So this is interesting because when you think about it in terms of the cost to farmers, 
they're not just pay, uh, now facing um, compliance costs, and these compliance costs are fencing, um, particular stocking um, regulations. Um, there might be um, a cap on nitrogen use, all these sort of things that farmers have to incur, but there's also some restriction on how you use that land. Once it's fenced, it's now become, under the regulation, um, there's a lot of restrictions around how you can use that land. So I think when you think about that regulatory response, it's often incentivizing farmers in a way that maybe may not have been intended, right? It's actually better for a farmer to not get a particular land being recognized under this uh, regulation because then they can still decide what they're going to do with that land. So, so the, the way we could think about it is this opportunity cost, right? What else could I use this land for? So it's not just the physical cost of fencing and all these other things, it's actually that opportunity cost. So the last thing I'm just gonna quickly talk about, if you could also see it in, in terms of an externality effect, right? When a farmer decides to um, enhance or protect a particular piece of wetland, the benefit accrues to the nation, but the farmer can only appropriate a small fraction of that. So there's a positive externality. And this is of course, why we have, for example, um, carbon sequestration units, right? We're trying to um, capitalize on those particular ecosystem services such that the farmer can um, appropriate them. I think I'll let you finish off. So, so um, the other factor that uh, is important and is part of our project is the people factor. And that's something that's come out in many of the discussions I've been having with people today, that you can put up as many graphs and throw as many facts at people as you like, but unless the people feel like they're empowered to come along with this, uh, then it's not necessarily gonna achieve um, the aim. So um, regulatory approach over overlooking the current, the existing, really strong grassroots interest in wetland uh, protection. Um, an emphasis on the individual compliance overlooks the value to the community and this idea of demonizing farmers and not trusting them to get on and do the right thing uh, is having a very clear impact on medical health, uh, sorry, mental health. So there's a research opportunity here um, about achieving the policy vision and having royal uh, rural voices being heard. And with that, I will hand over to Alicia. For the second talk. Thank you, Janice and Victoria. Now we are going to hear the second part from Alicia and Sarah about the results from the qualitative study of rural landowners. Uh, it's that one A L S W no one beneath it. Oh goodness, how does this work? Okay. Um if I just finger gun you, you'll know. <laughs> yeah, it'll be clear. Okay, can everybody hear me fine? Is that all good? Um and I just hold on to that there. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alicia Lord. Uh, I'm a graduate from the Department of Economics, and at the moment I'm working as a research assistant on an HKH project, which was um, came out of the seed fund, as Janice mentioned. Um, uh, and today, obviously, I'm gonna be here talking about the project that I've been working on because of that. So I'm working with Sarah, who's hiding behind the table. We all know who she is by now. Uh, Janice Lord, no relation, and Victoria Kahui. Um, as well. And so what Janice and Victoria have just given you is sort of the background or the introduction to our overall group project. Um, so they've talked about obviously the importance of wetlands and fresh waterways, um, as well as why we possibly need to regulate them, but then also some of those issues that come with regulation in terms of perverse incentives that it can generate where farmers maybe don't want to protect uh, these areas like the government hoped they would or um, just generally unintended consequences which weren't picked up in the calculations when they decided that the regulation would bring about a net benefit. 
So with that, Sarah and I um, will now walk you through sort of the introduction to our actual project, um, our methods and our uh, quite preliminary findings. We're still in the middle of that, um, but yeah. Anyway, the title today is Freshwater Management on Otago Farms Results from a Qualitative Study of Rural Landowners. Titles are great for giving you all the information you need. It has been a qualitative study of rural landowners and I'll elaborate a bit more on the methods behind that soon. But essentially we've been getting out into rural communities around Otago and interviewing landowners about their attitudes towards um, wetland restoration and planting natives, as well as their attitudes and their ideas towards the regulation that's coming into effect that is affecting the way that they use their land. Cool, so um, to start off, what are our research goals? Well, we've got a few going on here. Um, the first thing and where it all started and obviously still at the core of what we're doing is we want to understand the drivers of rural decision-making around um, things such as reforestation, revegetation and restoration. So in essence, how are landowners making decisions about native afforestation? Are they planting out wetland areas? Are they restoring what riparian zones or any other native areas on their farms? Why or why not? Really, what is incentivizing or disincentivizing that pro-environmental behavior? Um, the second thing we want to do is we want to explain how farmers are making sense of the regulations um, that are coming into play uh, around fresh water and to a lesser extent as well, biodiversity, um, and then how they are enacting that understanding. So um, as Janice and Victoria have mentioned, there is the fresh water policy coming in. That is going to be a lot for farmers to take in in terms of what they have to comply with, and that is on top of an already quite heavy list of regulations. So what we really want to know there is, one, how are farmers educating themselves on these regulations? and applying that to the context of their own property uh, or their business. And then secondly, uh, what strengths and what weaknesses do these landowners see in those regulations? Which leads us to our third and our fourth goal. Um, we want to identify any challenges that might exist in the um, current NPSFM, the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, um, in relation to agricultural land use change, and then from there possibly be able to provide input for the development of any future environmental policy. So if we detect that things are maybe uh, not working out so well with this policy, well, they're yet to sort of get carbon under control with the farmers, so maybe what we learn here could be useful there. So the key with that is that these, um, we want to see if the landowners indicate any of those perverse incentives or unintended consequences which were alluded to before. And these guys um, that we're talking to, they have so much on the ground experience, real world experience, working the land, working with the waterways and working with the animals. For better or for worse, they have the experience. So it's really, um, we see this great opportunity to sort of channel all of that knowledge, that experience into some findings that can be really clearly communicated with any other interested stakeholders. So that might be local or central government um, or just anybody who has a vested interest in the health of Otago waterways and um, just generally our environmental attributes. All right, cool. Our research methods. So it's qualitative study. We are doing interviews, um, semi-structured. They can take place face-to-face uh, -face or via Zoom. We obviously want to avoid on transport where we can, um, but especially some of the people closer to home, they've been really keen when you give them the option, they want you to come out and visit them. They actually want to show you where they're from, what their situation is. Um, so I kind of sense that maybe they just want to show, they, they're not just talking a good talk, they're actually really proud of their land. Um, for these people, it's often their home, their business, it's everything in one, and they really want you to see that um, firsthand. So we've been doing quite a few face-to-face. -face. We have 10 participants, so far we've interviewed eight, we've got a couple more in the pipeline. Um, and we found these people, uh, Janice had a couple of contacts from her own independent research, I had a couple myself, and then using a bit of snowball sampling, um, we've been able to expand a couple of initial contacts into uh, a slightly larger list of participants, and if time was on our side, it probably could have been a whole lot larger, but we'll just cap it at 10 for now and know that there's definitely people wanting to talk to us if we want to take this further. Um, we have just focused on the Otago region. Uh, the reason for that is, we're treating this project, uh, the funding that we got and the time that we have as a pilot study. Um, and so we thought that it's really important to understand the issues and the attitudes of our own backyard 
um, before going elsewhere. And if we find really interesting conclusions that we think could be taken or compared to other regions, then that gives us grounds for further study. Um, but I think that that's really important. That we didn't know this probably so much at the time, but it's a really good thing that we did just stick to Otago because as Sarah will mention, shortly, I'm sure. Um, something that's really been coming through in the results when we talk to them about their decisions around planting and how they feel about regulation is that farmers can't stress enough how area specific it is when they come to making, making decisions. And everywhere, every region around the country is completely different and yet the regulation does not address that. So I think it's a really good thing that we have just focus on Otago, it means that the conclusions that we draw can be really meaningful, really region specific, have high impact when we do share them with other parties. And we haven't gone and drawn some erroneous conclusion because we compared farms in all different regions around the country, okay? Um, right, next slide. So just to sort of talk, even though we are just focusing on Otago, we did want some diversity from within the region. So here's our participant map. Um, hopefully that's not too difficult to see but we have wanted a bit of um, di uh, diversity both geographically so you can see um, we have got people down near the Southland uh, South Otago border down in the Clutha Valley and then right up on the Canterbury border as well um, with people near Omaru. Uh, moving inland we've talked to people on the Maniatoto coming down the hill Middlemarch and then um, a bit closer to home we've got a nice little number of participants from the Dunedin Tyree area as well. Um, but it's not just um, geographical diversity we wanted, we also want diversity in terms of the farm types that we're looking at and the farmers that we're talking to. So we've had everything from people with 5,000, 6,000 hectare stations with very extensive sheep and beef farms to people with only 100, 150 hectare farms, highly stocked intensive dairy farms. Um, so for us, that's really important because we're wanting to know do these attitudes to planting and restoring wetlands in native areas and do the uh, attitudes towards or the impact of regulation, does that vary between these different kinds of participants, but then also do these participants, despite their obvious differences, uh, have anything in common? So are you able to flick back one? Um, the data that we do collect from the interviews is going to be analysed using an inductive approach, so thematic analysis, um, identifying the key themes, um, and somebody who knows a lot more about that and will uh, let you know about it now is Sarah. Okay, so um, I'll just, oh, let's go. Do you want that? Cool. Okay, so I'm just going to run through some really preliminary results um, because as we're still interviewing these, you know, are sort of hot off the press and, and we haven't really done a proper analysis and let alone a discourse analysis because that takes quite a lot of my headspace. So um, we'll just run through a few things that we're finding quite interesting um, coming out of the interviews. So first of all, this one here just has a little bit around the motivations um, for planting trees and restoring the um, wetlands on um, private property. And these are some of the things that we're hearing about around, and probably some of these we'd expect to hear as well, providing shelter um, for stock, um, also helping um, the aesthetic aspects of the property as well as the biodiversity um, as well. And there's some discussion, but not a great deal around um, the carbon sequestration um, around it. And also not much discussion there really about ecosystem services enhancing the, the planting. So we're not really hearing that coming through from our participants. How we will analyze the data at a later point will we'll bring some of that out. But as I said, we're just focusing on participant voice. Um, so what we became quite interested in, particularly we did, a, we did a pilot interview to begin with, and that really started to show us some of these aspects. And I've got to get my economics speak right because I'm really good at getting these around the wrong way and Victoria will scowl at me. Um, perverse incentives and unintended consequences. Um, and so we, be, we became quite interested in looking through that and asking some questions to try and pull that out um, of the farmers around how they saw that. And so, you know, um, because of the, the way, right, I'll be quick, um, because of the way that the um, you know, national policy statements are coming into play and the things that the farmers are thinking about, we're starting to see some of these coming through. Um, and so we're seeing talk about that immediate destruction of existing wetlands before they're deemed to be significant, um, which you can imagine is, um, you know, a, a 
well, the, the statement setting up a perverse incentive there was a very um, significant unintended consequence um, of that um, policy statement. Um, there we go, other things around the fertiliser as well. So we're seeing this kind of behaviour that's anticipating these future policies and trying to do things now um, in order um, from their point of view um, to to um, be able to manage the land. Um, and one thing, another thing just before I flick on there is around the mental health of landowners too. So um, our very first um, participant and um, actually even in the pilot, the word farming is in crisis was coming through and that was mentioned, you know, quite a few um, sort of times um, to us there. Um, and again, the loss of communities and family owned farms. And then that starts to really affect if there's no local school and there's no children and that loss of community starts to come through as the farms are only really going to be economically um, viable for more commercial oriented farmers as opposed to your sort of um, intergenerational farmer as well. So we've got different farmers out there too and we'll be teasing out some of that data as well. Um, and this here illustrates some of those um, aspects there, you, um, another sort of news article where we're seeing um, the issues upon farmers and we definitely um, heard about that and this quote here talks about it and sorry you can't see that very well, there seems to be pressures coming from every direction and then on top of that you're perceived as being a baddie like oh you're a farmer, you're just polluting, you're wrecking, like once again we're not actually getting the credit for what we're actually doing. So um, there's definitely that, that sense there um, and particularly that, that disconnect between how um, urban are seeing um, farming and what um, the rural and how they're seeing themselves um, as well. Um, and then we're going to start looking, and we've asked here as well, and this is again using participant voice here with these quotes around what might be some of the um, solutions here. And, um, and definitely the two things that are coming through, well first, sorry, the three, the first one there is around the funding aspects. Um, and about the cost um, of this legislation for the individual farms. Um, we also heard more around the um, targeted regulations and Alicia alluded to this before where she talked about the fact that this is a blanket policy statement, but actually we've got different catchments and um, Janice mentioned that as well, um, around that sort of more catchment um, model um, and there's a, the quote there is talking about that. And so we heard, we've heard a lot about that as well and about the more consultation and this is, you know, about talking to people about having a more collaborative um, decision making model that works at a catchment level where you're um, getting people together. And there are examples of that um, occurring, um, for example, there's one um, why Wanaka um, is, who are trying to do that. So just um, to finish off um, my final slide, um, I just wanted to allude to the multidisciplinary approach here that we're taking and that we all come from different disciplines. Um, the joy of that is that we're all learning off each other, um, but also we're going to be able to bring these different heads to the data to be able to, um, when we you know, finish these interviews and actually start the analysis um, process, we've actually got um, sort of management, botany, economics, um, and Nicholas Sweeney's back from um, his various different trips as well, providing that um, geography um, perspective as well. And that allows us to look at the data um, across and being able to understand and um, sort of pick apart, for want of a better term, the um, things that are being said and look at the arguments around that. Um, it makes um, for a much more robust um, process. And I guess if you think back to my talk about Heiko Papahona Na, that's one of the big things that we're you know, really pushing is that multidisciplinary action. So I'll just sort of make another plug for it um, here as well. And I had nothing to do with the decision of the seed funding, I should say, because that does look a little bit odd now, doesn't it? <laughs> um, whoops, um, I stayed well out of that. Anyway, that's um, our last slide. Thank you very much.